that today here is I'm flipping all these battery charges around and walking around my used car lot. It's starting to look like a used car lot here. <laughs> it's funny now, but moving all this stuff around, what happened yesterday, at the end of the day, it, I didn't get it on video either. It started pouring and I had bikes out in the driveway and I was doing other stuff and had Chris's bike out there. Ah, anyway, the weather beat us yesterday. It's not going to beat us today. I have a very simple goal today. And the weather should be good enough. It really got cold again, but it should be good enough that I can do some painting this afternoon. Now we have Chris's bike finished, and I haven't heard from her yet. She's got to work out her work schedule when she's going to come pick it up. Uh, and that will free up, of course, some more space. But I had a very interesting thing happen in the last couple days that I thought I'd share with my friends. I know there's counterpoints to everything. This is something you may have a total counterpoint to. But I thought this was worth sharing among our friends. And it's really a pretty simple thing. I had showed on a previous video that I adjusted the chain on Chris's bike. It was really, really sloppy. And I had seen videos of bikes where the chain did come off and, and whatnot. And so what happened? It set off a chain of events in my circle of friends. And several people contributed. And I really appreciate that they contribute. I appreciate that they watch the videos that the various ways you can adjust the chain and of course there are many and there are there are certainly endless amount there's probably hundreds but but the point to always remember is everything in life that i've ever found from modeling to motorcycling to working on your car there's there's a lot of ways to do everything even painting there's various ways people do painting and shortcuts and tricks and and the the pitfall is to think that your way is the only way or not be willing to find other ways to do it. So this is why I love YouTube. I look at YouTube and I see 20 different guys showing different ways to do things, change tires, remove fairings. I've used YouTube probably once a month. I find something out that I didn't know before. But, but to always keep in mind, it's a, it's a critical thing to keep in mind. There's more than one way to do every possible thing. There's always another way, a better way, a cheaper way, a quicker way. And, and the trick in life is to find what works for you. My job is only just to share what I've learned over my 50 years of doing this. And a lot of it, I'm sure, is, can be improved upon. But even if you can't improve upon it, that way gets the job done. So on my channel, what I always try to do, and I try to do it to the best of my ability, is take my knowledge base, which goes back way over 50, it may even be closer to 60 years now, and share what I've learned, and I've learned pretty much everything the hard way. I haven't gone to MMI, I haven't gone to uh, well, any high-tech Ferrari schools or anything. I have Luciano to teach me things, and help me things, and Vince, and Glenn, and we all try to share information, and Mark Morgan, and whatever, Turbo Steve. Everybody's got a little piece of the puzzle, and when we put it all together, and we share all that information, and you can pick from the menu of things how you would like to do certain things, there's a lot of different ways to do them. And I would suggest, if you don't like the way I do it, go out to YouTube and dial in how to change tires, how to replace brake pucks, how to do this, that, or the other thing. Because many, many people have shared what they know on YouTube, and it's all free. Now with Chris's bike, the other day we learned a valuable lesson with those rubber tire valves. And I'm sure I've figured something out after thinking about it for a lot of days. Those valves, the same ones that were on her bike, came when I bought the R1. And I remember, because these discs are so big, in the very beginning, I couldn't figure out how to get my hand into those and get the top. And I checked the, top, the pressure every time I ride the bike. So I'd bend that valve and pull it off to the side and... Uh, and I'll bet somebody in the life of this motorcycle, and Chris doesn't have, there's other people have owned this bike, was manhandling that valve, couldn't get their fingers in by the disc. They basically have the same discs. They look they're pretty similar anyway. But, but the clearances and everything. And so by showing how easy it is to damage that valve and how life-threatening it could be, that's a great thing to have in your knowledge base. And think about that. Those valves... Now, I was extra careful the other day. I was checking the, uh, when I did the little refresh and cleaned up the RD, I said, oh, I better be real careful.
This bike has tubes. I don't want to pull that valve over. And you, you, you never, on a, like on the R1, want to pull that valve way over. I think you really stress it. And I think that's what happened in the course of, I'm trying to put the evidence together like I'm a detective. When that thing blew up on my workbench, that got my full undivided attention. In any of, the, any of the motorcycles, it doesn't matter if it's a sport bike or a touring bike or a, an adventure bike or what. If that front tire blows out at speed and you're not a super aware expert rider that's used to dealing with adversity or... <laughs> and even if you are, it can ruin your whole day. So that's my spiel for the morning. And I'm cold. It's freezing cold out here. But I don't know why I always come out without a jacket on thinking it's not that cold. And I go inside and warm up the coffee and go, what the hell was I thinking? Anyway, it's time. You would think after all these years, I'd have enough sense to put a coat on when I go out there to flip battery charges. Unbelievable. But the coffee is always warm. And that coffee usually gets me started and motivated in the morning, but oogling my parts gets me motivated too now. We're not far from the day that we're going to look days. I don't know how long it's going to take. Getting these parts all assembled back on a bike. I did not want to do it or even start to do it while I had other projects in the shop. And I was hoping I could get somebody to come over and, uh, you know, especially for the fairing parts. Because these, if you have an extra set of hands, doing the assembly is easy. Well, we'll get it done even if we don't have somebody. But most of my friends have been very generous, and Turbo Steve especially, and you, Luciano and Glenn. When I did need a hand, they were very reliable friends. And I've tried to be a reliable friend, but you never know that my life is so volatile right now that every day something new happens and I always try to keep in mind everybody's got a personal life and the things we share on YouTube they're a lot of fun but you really the number one thing you always have to take into account is the family has to come first so we have seven parts from Vlad's Aprilla Mondale whatever that is Mondalino or whatever it is there, there's always something exotic he loves exotic bikes but these parts, now I put some clear on the first two. They've been drying down here under a heating vent for a couple of days so we can work on them. And I wanted to do this very carefully because there's always a problem when you're painting over somebody else's finish. I want to make sure they're clean, make sure they're scuffed, and make sure we get at least two and maybe three coats of clear on everything. And then have it dry for a couple of days. First day out in the garage in cold weather and then a couple of days down here under heating vents. So for this part of the job, we're going to use 600 grit, Indasa wet, Rhino wet, the red line. This is the better quality of the two grades that they have. So the first thing, by looking at these parts, each one of these, this is a real Aprilla racing part. And it's, it's really, this is nicely made, by the way. And I can see they vacuum bagged this part. That's very nice. And they used a... a big uh, large weave material on that and then they put a cosmetic piece on the other side so I know this is more than one lamination so there's a couple of things right off the bat I want to know anything I have whether I get a used part or a new part when I know it's been vacuum bagged I know for sure one of two things they used a really good mold release agent on this at some point even if this is a used part that silicone tends to stay with it well, even if you wax it use it there's always something in carbon fiber that can cause fish eyes. So it's the most important thing. Take the part before you even start or ever even put sandpaper near it and get some simple green on it and get, that'll take a lot of it off. Then to take, I'm going to just go through the steps one by one. Then to take some prep wall after that, because I don't want to take the sandpaper and grind any of that silicone down into the sanding scratches. That's when you have fish eyes, it's because you almost always didn't clean the part before you sanded it. And that's a critical thing. I try to put it on all the videos on my channel because people that really want to know how to paint and they run into fish eyes on a beautiful project they put hundreds of hours in, really gets frustrating. And how do I know? Ask me, because it's happened to me. And as I've said so many times before, when whenever you're painting and you, I even do the back part because here's what's going to happen if there's silicone wax grease and these these are used parts I think they look used anyway at I'm going to touch this with my hand and then get some grease up here 
And I remember one part that Turbo Steve seat. We had a nightmare of a time getting rid of the fish eyes. I just couldn't. We even bought special stuff at Chard. Steve will remember. And we just went crazy trying to get rid of the fish eyes. I mean, in the end, the part came out great. But I think we put in, uh, and Steve put in an awful lot of hours before we got rid of those fish eyes. So from, from my experience, the thing is always to get each part before you even touch it with sandpaper. Get it as clean as you can. Simple green is a good way to start. I use prep oil after this, and the prep oil clean it up, and then we'll be ready to sand it. Now, a lot of parts I can use a soft block, a hard block. This, there's almost no flat spots on this. So this is just going to be a part that I've got to use in soapy water. It's totally clean before I ever hit it with sandpaper. And I want to get a scuffed 600. Now, some people use 1,000, some people use 1,200. Again, it's that thing I started talking about earlier in the video because... I think it's a lot of people don't realize they they get locked into the idea well you you hear it with motorcycles too you hear people say oh the only good bike is a honda or a suzuki or a ducati or something and they're not open to the idea that there's a lot of a lot of different ways to do things there's a lot of different ways to enjoy motorcycling and some people do like myself they get heavily involved and they want to try everything and do everything and up to a point and and some people just want to relax and buy a nice touring bike and drive to California and go see Dallas and uh, whatever. But whatever it is, it's a menu of things you can choose from. And they're all good. And all the people that ride bikes should respect, I think, the other people. Like, I have a lot of respect for one thing, for people that have trials bikes. When, I think back in the 70s, I had one of the Suzuki trial bikes. Basically because Westwood Suzuki couldn't sell it. I got it really cheap and at the time I had a big piece of property in Little Ferry and I set up barrels and logs and Of course, it wasn't a street bike. So you couldn't do anything. You couldn't go out on a street with it But I looked at TV and saw people jumping over logs and cars and stuff and I thought I was going to be able to do it and It wasn't as it wasn't as easy as it looked so basically here Without making a big to-do about it, I wanted to dry this and show. You really have to dry it sometimes with a hair dryer to see. I don't want any shiny spots. The correct preparation will be, now see there's a little shiny spot right down there. And these parts are going to go on a very expensive collector bike, so I want them to be perfect. I, I want them to be perfect if they went on a $300 RD or Chris's bike or uh, anything. Well, it doesn't even matter. But So the whole surface, I'll take my time. Get this whole part flat sanded. That is a critical thing. And then I'll clean it again with sickens. And if you watch the old videos, you see I was cleaning parts with a product called M600. Sickens M600. Not available around here anymore, but it is way better of a product than prep wool. If you can get it where you are. Sickens M600. Now the extra step, and it's a step I would suggest if you're doing your own motorcycle or you really want your work to be bulletproof in every way. Everywhere there's an edge on anything you paint, radius the edge. The reason is you, paint tends to crack. It's like a connecting rod. The reason they polish connecting rods is because cracks start on a sharp edge. If there's no sharp edges, a lot less chance they'll crack. So if I were to leave a razor edge here from vibration, and of course this is a twin cylinder bike, I think, there's going to be a lot of vibration. And I don't want that paint to crack there. It's just, I like this to be a perfect job. And I'd like to see this when I see this bike in real life and Vlad's up on Perkins or wherever, or we go for a ride together. I want to look at that bike and be, be proud of the work that I've done to it. So I will get this all sanded flat. All the radius is there. And then I need to figure a way I'm going to jig it up. And then I think what I'll do is I'll mix up a... A, a batch of clear and go out and just see if I can if these parts are going to be prone to fish eyes and if they are see by painting one part as a guinea pig then what I've done is stack the deck that I'm not going to get all the parts sanded and go out and they all got they all have fish eyes in them I don't want that to happen okay we have the first part totally prepped and ready so what I'm going to do is mix up some of that Gavco clear 
and just shoot one part. I got to make up a mount for this. Shoot one part just to see if we're going to have any fish eye issues. Now talking about the clear, we've had good luck with Gavco. In fact, I just bought another gallon. I, I'm just happy with this product and it works just as good as a five star. I think so anyway. And I always use the cheapest spray guns I can. I have one for every color. There's one always ready sitting here waiting with paint in it for touch-ups for pretty much every color we set, we use. But I do use them often. If you put them away for the year, maybe you should clean them better. But I clean these with acetone, take the tip off, and I know people think, oh yeah, you could get a different gun, more expensive gun. These seem to work pretty good for me. And our beautiful Harbor Freight compressor. This is absolutely the world's loudest compressor. If you really want to annoy your neighbors, take it outside when you're painting. And unbelievable, huh? Holy now, I always laugh. There's always a lot of people that have come to the shop for the first time and they say, Oh my God! You know, you got a $15 spray gun and you got a, a compressor that's like an atomic bomb and all your tools look all beat up and God almighty, you, you got that. Man, you'd be a great painter if you only had better equipment. Well, I don't think the equipment is really a big part of it. It's a small part, but I think you can do some pretty nice work with some pretty inexpensive equipment. These babies have served me well. Then I, I don't know what to say. Yeah, I'd like to have, you want to send me a $1,500 spray gun? I'll use it and, but I have had good luck using very inexpensive equipment and a lot of passion. So I had this out in the sun and as it's starting to dry, I want to show you, if you look at it real close, there's every indication that there's going to be a fisheye problem on there. So I'm really looking at, you see how that, that all those little cavities. So I'm going to hope, well, that the next coat is going to cover that up. We're going to let this dry about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. And put a second coat on because I want to be sure I can cure that fisheye problem. Now that's, that's very typical of what happens when you go to paint anything carbon fiber. So what, we, what we're going to try to do is just bury it, bury it in clear and hope that, that that's going to be part of the answer. Well, again, we're going to find out. Now the nuclear option on this, if this doesn't work, is you take it downstairs, you take some acetone, if the second coat doesn't clear that up, and you wipe the part and throw the tissue away, wipe the part, throw it away, but we're going to wait in 20 minutes from now and see if this is why I'm doing an experiment before I paint those parts. Because you never know what carbon fiber can really make you crazy. It's not like dealing with normal stuff. There's always that. See, the, some of the carbon fiber, the problem is in the material itself that you've buried it and you're opening up little pockets of that material that's right in the cloth itself. So anyway, the next step on this, I'm going to put this aside. Go have a cup of coffee. Come back, see if the second coat clears that up, and see if it's our lucky day. All right, the second coat looks a little bit better. And maybe the third coat will look even better than this. I guess, I guess we're going to find out. So now you can see all the little imperfections, the little fish eyes, and there's not... There's no way I know around this other than what we're going to have to do if this doesn't get cured in the next coat. I, it's very simple. I'm going to have to wipe this all off before it really hardens with acetone. But I don't know. It looks like maybe it is going to settle down. We really won't know for quite a while, for 20 minutes or half an hour. But looks like I'm going to be drinking a lot of coffee today. So while I'm waiting for that to dry, I thought it's going to be appropriate. I'll clean this part up. And I, I kind of knew this was going to happen. I kind of knew I knew. Because every, every one of the carbon fiber parts. Now let's see if this is manufactured the same way. This one's full of dirt on the back too. 
So we got to clean this up. But every one is like a unique animal because the different materials that they use, the different release agents. Anybody that's ever done any molding work knows what a frustrating thing it is using molding release and then it doesn't release or you don't put enough wax on or enough PVA or and the parts that have silicone in them that work real well it gets into the material and then you go to paint it and it makes you crazy but we try to share what we know we don't know everything needless to say oh, oh we wouldn't have this problem but then we do know more that we obviously for some people that are doing their first carbon fiber part if you had this hugger and you want to paint over that clear and you think you're just going to go get a, a spray can and go over well i hope you have better luck than i do but anyway, that's the beauty of YouTube. You can see, and I, as I said in the beginning of this video, there's a lot of different ways to do things. There's a lot of really good ways, a lot of real efficient ways, a lot of ways, if you have unlimited money, if you're Jay Leno, you got a big garage, you have air conditioning, you have heat, that changes the whole program. But what I try to show is that you can do a lot of this stuff really on a budget. And there's not a lot of money, and not a lot of high-tech stuff. It's like being a mason. You want to be a mason, you need a cement mixing pail and a shovel and a trowel. And you're a mason. You can go in business. But you got to know what the hell you're doing laying bricks. That's the problem. So anyway, I'm going to prep this part up because I've got about a 20-minute window. I've got to wait and see if those fish eyes are going to get worse or better. Or if I'm going to wipe that off with acetone and start all over again. Or... If these parts are going to be a problem, so by having, I'll have a sample because I have two of everything except this. I think there's two, two, and two, and one. So if, and the odds are good, if one part's a problem, they're all going to be a problem. If one part works great, and then I have my two parts that I put my clear on already, will it give me a little view of if that's going to be more of a problem. But that's why sharing this information to me. I'm very passionate about it. I really think it's important because without this information, if every person has to figure this out on your own, you're in a deep pool of water. Okay, this is just about timing now that we can go shoot this with clear and see how this is going to play out. I'm never quite sure until I actually get it done. So just to show you how unpredictable this whole thing of carbon fiber is, this part has, for all purposes, no fish eyes at all, even on the first coat, which means the second coat's going to be even better. It, it only gets better. It's the first coat that you're going to wind up because that's where it's touching the silicone material. Now this, the first part we did, and this has two coats, and it still has a hint of fish eye in there. Not completely terrible. I'm hoping the next coat will kind of go over that, but we're going to see as we start on this, as this job evolves, it's going to get very interesting. Now it looks like each coat is laying down just a little bit better than the one before. And this is actually the third coat on this one part, but now, so it's just telling me that for it, every part is different. That hugger is only going to need two or three coats. This is probably going to need 10 by the time I get that sealed up that I can really, really put a high gloss buffing finish on that for Vlad. But keep in mind, Vlad is a big collector of exotic bikes and he, he wants these things to be perfect just as I do. It's the passion we share. And the only problem we've really faced right now, the wind is starting to blow more and more. But you can see how the paint is laying down. You've got to be really careful on that first coat that you get rid of as many of the fish eyes as possible. And it just buried a whole part. Now, 
This, the Gavco Clear and the Five Star seem to do a good job of burying little defects like that. But I'm not sure because I know there's a lot of different brands of Clear. And as I said in the beginning of this video, there's probably 10 people right now watching this saying, Oh, I use this brand of Clear. I use this. I use that. I use that. Yes, but this is the only way I can share. I don't have those products available to me. So if somebody wants to send me a gallon of Clear, I'll test it for sure. And I mean, the proof is in the pudding. Every one of these bikes that I've painted has been with very low, low dollar equipment and a lot of, a lot of passion. And it's time for a coffee break. Best part of the morning. We're going to get these all done today, I think. The day is playing out very well. And here's the good news. When you're waiting for paint to dry, it dries a lot faster when you're drinking a cup of coffee. So we got one good part that's has no fish eyes one that we've got three coats on before the fish eyes started to disappear <laughs> not sure if it's a lucky day because we got five more parts to paint hey when you take a break you got to fill up the bird feeder <laughs> this they need a break too <laughs> back to work now usually my day changes in exactly the opposite way it just changed karen hasn't been feeling good lately and i asked her do you need anything from the store do we need any errands today and guess what? No errands. So what that means to me is I originally started off today thinking I'd get some of these in clear coat. Maybe I'll get even more. In fact, I'll work a little longer than I normally would. I'd like to get everything in clear. Knowing that tomorrow it's supposed to be a nice warm day and maybe we'll get a ride in or Chris will pick up a bike or go up and see Luciano or any of the many things that you do when, uh, when you're involved in <laughs> the wonderful world of motorcycling. Anyway, I'm going to get this sanded and go see, Brad, take advantage of the fact that I have a little extra time today. And every one of these parts, and I'm trying to share this information. This may look like, oh, I'll just paint it. Some of them have that fisheye issue. Some of them don't. And, and every one of them is a unique little entity. Now I'm ready to go out and shoot this part and see how the other ones are handling uh, the second and third coat. Well, by doing this, we're kind of leapfrogging our way into uh, obscurity here. Now that part does not look like it has any fisheye issues at all. This one looks like it's as clean as a whistle. That's going to really be good. When we give these a second and third coat, I think this one, I think we'll be able to bury it in one or two extra coats of clear, but I'll wait to the end of the day to put some extra clear on that. But so far, absolutely working out great. And we're really using up this day to our good advantage. Now these are the pieces that had no finish on them at all and we've put on the first couple of coats of clear. These just need a very light sanding and they'll be ready for exactly what we're doing to the parts that had the clear. In other words, this part simulates the finish that we already have on the other parts. Now we've done the twin to every one of these parts. I've cleaned the last three up cleaned them all down with simple green. I'm going to sand them, get the jigs made up, and I'll do the last three of them all at the same time, just to save time. And then we'll have a waiting period of well, 20 minutes, half an hour, we'll see. And I'll try to get, and I'll try to make sure every part has three full coats on. And if the end of the day comes and we've got every one of those fish eyes buried and the parts that don't have real fish eye issues, Everything should be drying up in a garage tonight. Boy, will I sleep good at night. And we have taken advantage of, at that point in time, we have taken advantage of some really, a really good painting day, except for that wind blowing. But as I've learned many times in the past, if you're gonna wait for the wind to stop blowing, you're probably not gonna get a lot painted, that's for sure. 
So because it looks like we have this fisheye thing under control, I feel real confident about doing the last three parts all at the same time. And I'll put on the last coat of clear on this coat of clear on, and then I'm going to have to wait. And usually it's a good idea to wait a little longer than 20 minutes. Of course, the temperature is still, it's about 45 degrees out there. Give it a little extra dry time, and then we'll put on that last coat. Well, we'll be in, we'll be in good shape today. Well, I think you can see how nice these parts are coming out. And over the course of this day, I got three real good coats of clear on everything. And it's sitting in the garage drying up like jewelry. That has turned out to be a longer day than I thought it would, but because we didn't have any errands to do, and I kind of took advantage of that. All this clear is drying up. There's three coats of clear on everything. Everything's going to dry up beautifully tonight. It's probably not going to go below freezing, but once this sits in a garage overnight, oh, I'll bring it in the house. It's Carbon fiber is a beautiful thing, and I hope from watching this video, I've got some ideas if you want to upgrade a clear coat or whatever. And I think the only thing you can't realistically do that I've never found that I was able to do with this paint is do a muffler, a carbon fiber muffler. You have to do that with polishing the resin. Put extra resin on it and high temperature resin, buff it out. The only way I found that I did GS mufflers and they worked out fine and I did the ones that are on the R1. So hope that information is of some value. But boy, having those parts sitting out here tonight, I'll sleep like a baby. So I hope you picked up some good information about painting carbon fiber, putting a finish on it. But always keep in mind that thing about the muffler, because I know people that have painted a muffler and been real disappointed. It's, it's, if, especially if you ride hard. And, and maybe you could do one that, if, that you don't ride hard, I don't know. Anyway, thank you Dave Midgley and Dick Hewitt for help with their always over the years. Carbon fiber, Huntsman resin, the whole thing. And I just wanted to, I'm looking at these parts and when I get Vlad's parts buffed out. They're going to be every bit as beautiful. But right now they have to sit out in the garage overnight. They'll sit down here for two or three days. And in the meantime, tomorrow looks like it's going to be a riding day. It looks like it's supposed to go up the 50. Have you heard that word? 50s. Matt, we can go riding in a t-shirt. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure. Anyway, again, I do hope you enjoyed the video and thanks a lot for watching.